Good evening. Good evening, everyone. My name is Dr. Brian Collins. I'm with Science Safety. I want to thank you for attending tonight's presentation, What School Administrators, Principals, Supervisors Need to Know About Science, STEM, and CTE Programs from a Legal and Liabilities Perspective. Our presenter tonight, Dr. Ken Roy, is an internationally recognized authority in the field of science, STEM, CTE, and safety education. Dr. Roy has been a valued member of the Glastonbury Public School System in Connecticut and the Safety Officer and Chief Safety Blogger for the Council of State Science Supervisors, NSELA, NSTA, and ITEA. Earlier this year, he co-authored a book called Safer Engineering and CTE Instruction, a National STEM Education Imperative which can be downloaded for free at sciencesafety.com. We're honored to have him present tonight's session in our ongoing series of professional development and learning webinars provided to you by Science Safety. During the presentation, please feel free to put your comments and any questions in the chat box, and we will do our best to respond live during the session. We will do a Q&A after the presentation. Please mute your microphone to minimize any background interference. With that said, we appreciate your interest in safety education, Dr. Roy, it is all yours. Thank you, Brian. Appreciate it. And I want to say good evening to everybody. And thank you uh, for most of you coming here in the evening uh, to raise your level of awareness. Let's just put it that way in a very serious, serious issue. So K-12 safety webinar, all right? Legal liability concerns for school principals, administrators, school district officers. Summary of the webinar, it's always been facilitated by moi, internationally recognized academic practical safety educator. On this session, we will explore the legal liability issues. Very, very important and often overlooked until there's an accident that exists in science, STEM, CTE, and other disciplines, and look at how a holistic, in other words, what's the whole picture, the spectrum, safety program can help you increase safety awareness and stay safer with your students. Notice, I wanna point out one word in that paragraph, safer. I wanna start from the get-go, and this could be a shock at the beginning. You cannot guarantee that you can make it safe, all right? You can't guarantee you can make it safe, but the good news is you can make it, always make it safer. You can always make it safer. So please use caution. Don't tell people you're going to make it safe if they use all this PPE, if they follow these safety procedures, because accidents can still happen. All right. But you most definitely, and I can prove this by research that we've done that we'll talk about a little later on, that you can make it safer. Uh, as Brian noted, I'm Director of Environmental Health and Safety, Chemical Hygiene Officer, et cetera, et cetera, for Glastonbury Public Schools. I'm the Chief Science Safety Compliance Advisor, Chief Safety Blogger for National Science Teaching Association, uh, Safety Compliance Officer, uh, National Science Education and Leadership Association. I've authored over 13 science and STEM laboratory safety books and over 800 safety articles, professional journals that are listed there. It almost sounds like I have no life. No, I do. I really I have a great life, seriously. But I love what I do, and this is why I do it, to help people make them safer. <clears throat> Okay, schools and li legal liability, right? Many teachers falsely, all right? Now, this is, again, is kind of a little bit of a shocker. Falsely believe that they are protected by what collectively is called held harmless clause. I live in the state of Connecticut. We have one of the strongest held harmless clauses on the planet, right? Their employment agreements or in other teachers' unions federation protective comments because they are certified professional educators. Let me tell you, one of the things I did not mention in my short CV there a few slides ago is I do expert witness work. And mostly I'm hired by students, parents, lawyers for kids that have gotten hurt in laboratory accidents. Let me tell you, if a teacher and or administrator, and usually it's both joint liability, all right, even though they're supposedly held harmless, they're licensed, they're certified, this, that, whatever. If I determine that they are negligent or even worse, reckless, in most cases, held harmless just melts away, 
all right? It just melts away and you can be sued and it's not gonna be pretty, believe me, all right? So this is a very important thing that you need to have an understanding of because I mean, you may have heard totally the opposite, right? Let's be clear, this is a false assumption and often teachers are found, and I must say, and administrators and their supervisors are found to be negligent or even worse, reckless. In other words, you knew something was unsafe, but you still went ahead, either did it or allowed it to be done, all right? That is being reckless because of the failures under their duty of inst instruction, supervision, and or maintenance when a student is severely injured, all right? Just not good. <clears throat> okay, the duty or standard of the care under common law statutes and interpretations, teachers have an or standard of care to protect their students from all reasonable foreseeable risks of injury and harm. That's the key, foreseeable risks, injury or harm, all right? All reasonable and foreseeable. The duty or standard of care often used, this is the legalese, all right? The kinds of things that I take a look at as an expert witness, was in fact the duty or standard of care followed? Was it met? Because that's gonna determine for you as a defendant, more than likely, um, if you're guilty or not, right? The duty or standard of care often used as what would a careful or prudent parent would do in this situation when determining the legal liability. Legal liability, in simple terms, was the educator negligent or reckless in that instant, right? And again, I wanna emphasize, this is often shared liability shared liability. Legal liability in case law in STEAM and CTE. Labs of today are less safe, less safe, because students are inadequately instructed in safety and teachers do not have adequate experience to lead students safely. A quote from the study, 2008, right? This is 2022? And we, we still have this situation. Technology education, CTE, industrial education, engineering education, science education, laboratories are potentially dangerous places, which is why teachers must not only be concerned with student and faculty safety, but also their own. I cannot begin to tell you, all right? In my consultant firm, I often work with administrators in school building as chief building ministers, the principals. And some of the things that I hear and, and again, I'm not blaming. And, and again, I salute all the administrators that are online here tonight because you're taking the initiative to face this, to raise your level of awareness and make things safer for your students and your employees. But they'll come out sometimes with things like, well, I don't think it's that really that much say, uh, unsafe compared to a math class or a language arts. Excuse me, are you kidding me? All right, have they stepped foot in that laboratory? Do they see the hazards and resulting potential risks? It's unbelievable, all right? So again, beware. Liability, there's no requirement to report injuries and accidents in science and chemical. This is not like if you are shot on the street and they bring you to the hospital, well, there's a federal registry you have to call, you know, the hospital has to call, you know, everybody knows that this happened and such and such. There's really no formal legal requirement for reporting these injuries. And many go unreported, even to the local, sometimes even the local board of education is unaware of it. The only time an accident has to be reported is litigation is involved. Ah, of course, that's because it hits the papers, the news media, um, social, you know, there you go. If a student is harmed in a science STEM or CTE room, there's a potential for shared liability. Uh-oh. That means this goes beyond the instructor, or beyond the teacher. In almost every single expert witness case I have done over the last decade, not only has the teacher been brought into that lawsuit, but also the supervisor and administrator, including the superintendent of schools because he or she is the CEO of the corporation, so to speak, and has ultimate responsibility under duty or standard of care, right? Nor to, because they failed to prevent harm to students. 
If there's a severe accident, the teacher, the administrator in the school district could be found to be negligent, again, or worse, reckless, involving deliberate indifference. Use safety awareness in legal safety standards, better professional practice, safety practices to mitigate against possible liability that exists in these subject areas. Again, legal safety standards. What's a legal safety standard? Legal safety standard. We're talking about OSHA. Now remember, OSHA, pardon my French, doesn't give a rat's ass about kids, <laughs> all right? Technically, they are only there to protect employees. However, however, <clears throat> those OSHA standards need to also be followed by students because if they don't follow those procedures and protocols, it would be an unsafe working environment for that employee. So in effect, though, and, and this is more of a better professional safety practice, not a legal one, that it covers anybody, any occupant in that laboratory. That's what we're looking at. Understanding why there are risks. There was an emphasis on hands-on, the doing. You learn by doing, not just sitting there reading about it. We're looking on a computer, all right? The doing, the hands-on science, STEM, CTE, fab labs, and maker spaces to increase student engagement. That's what this is all about, as you know. But of course, with the engagement, as it sees there in the the large print increases the potential for hazards and resulting risks. Again, potential for safety hazards and resulting risks for staff and students. So there are physical, chemical, and biological. Again, three areas, three areas, all right? We're talking about hazards and risks. Physical, chemical, and biological in any laboratory, all right? Inherent in these programs in all open to the teacher, the principal, and the school district to liability. Having a solid risk management program is essential to providing a comprehensive hands-on classes for students and also for the employee, for the teacher. Things can go wrong in the laboratory and these situations are mostly preventable. Again, this whole idea of not safe, but safer. Here are some examples, all right? We're not fabricating, we're not making this stuff up, all right? I'm not gonna read every single thing here, but the one, there's one in Virginia. Uh, we just had another one in Virginia, 2017. Five students seriously injured as a result of a teacher performing a dangerous chemical experiment using open flames in methanol. When will they learn? When will they learn? You don't have active flames with methanol in an open area on a demo desk, all right? tragedies happen. 2018, again, Tennessee closed after 12 students, a dozen accidentally burned chemical flash fire in science laboratory. <clears throat> 2019, San Diego, middle school student, 13 year old, had his face severely burned to teacher reckless in the classroom while performing activity using, of course, alcohol. Alcohol in active flames don't mix. This is what happens, all right? And this kid is scarred for life. I always end my expert witness summaries, which I must provide, sometimes those are 40, 50 pages based on legal safety standards, bad professional practices. I always end it with the sense, and you think you're sending your kid to a safe place. Not so safe, is it? 2019, Georgia, high school student, 15, badly burned across his face and body in a fire in a science laboratory, right? Again, same thing over and over and over. Methanol accent, the one I just referred to in Virginia, 2022, all right? Four students were burned when methanol ignited during the demonstration. School administration was not aware of the lab activity, All right? Excuse me, standard, duty, care? They're not aware of the kinds of laboratories that are going on? At least the direct supervisor should have at least some, or the chemical hygiene officer, All right? Oh, wait a minute, they didn't have a chemical hygiene officer it was found out to be. Interesting. 
All right. No PPE or preventative measures were used by the teacher or students during the demo. Are you kidding me? You have an active flame and you have no eye protection? No hazard analysis was performed by the teacher. Key, prior to the activity. You don't do it after the accident, all right? Before you do the activity, you do a hazard analysis and a risk assessment and you determine what safety actions need to be taken. And as a supervisor, an administrator, it is your responsibility to do the standard of care to make sure that teacher is doing that, all right? So you don't go through the agony that these administrators are going through in Virginia. Who is ultimately liable if a student is injured in the laboratory and there's no designated CHO or EHO? <clears throat> if there's no designated CHO in the school district, then responsibility automatically defaults to, you ready? The superintendent of schools. They're the CEO. That's their responsibility. Oh, I'm sorry, you don't have a chemical hygiene officer according to OSHA? Yes, you do. By default, it's the superintendent of schools, right? Regardless of their background. Okay, I'm feeling really good about this. Regardless of their background, their education, their experience. I mean, they could have probably taught language arts and they're gonna know what about being a chemical hygiene officer and those responsibilities about chemical use, chemical disposal, training, all the legal regulatory requirements? Well, I think you can picture what's going on here. Really, really bad news. Schools are not doing a good job protecting their students or teachers in reducing their liability. And it seems very interesting. Again, I do consultant work uh, for individual school districts from time to time. And it's interesting to hear about the principals and other administrators saying, you know, we don't, I've heard, this is a quote, we don't have time for safety, really safety training. You know, we're, we're more concerned about curriculum. Now, very few of them say that, believe me, because most people in administrative supervisory positions are responsible people and they want the best for their students. So don't let me make it sound like this is one side it's not, right? But those people are out there, right? They don't have time. And I hear this from the universities and boy, does it show when you, these neophytes come in, you hire them, they go into a lab and then they get you in trouble because they didn't have any safety training, even though that is your responsibility also in addition to the schools. <clears throat> what the data tells us, all right? Um, this is a result of a study that Dr. Tyler Love, PhD at Penn State U, and I did in 2020. And uh, very insightful, very scary, for what we found. And uh, we've had a number of articles on it and webinars and the like. What does David tell? Well, the key findings from the 2020 study, all right, investigating safety in US STEM and CTE lab. There. Now remember STEM, we're talking science, we're talking tech ed, we're talking math, sometimes even STEAM, all right? You throw art into it, right? 51% of the schools nationally have had an injury that led to litigation. That's over half. So you can be almost pretty sure that if there's an injury, you're gonna get sued, okay? 80% of science and STEM teachers reported having one injury in the past year. 80% had at least one injury? 35% of the teachers, STEM and CT, did not have any formalized safety training. Well, that's just great. I am so glad that my kid is in one of those classes. No, I don't think so, all right? I'm just telling you the way what the findings were. I'm not making this stuff up. What the data tells us, more key findings. There are other key findings. It's, again, I, I, I find I just, I couldn't believe it when I was processing the data that we received. 41% of the schools perform a chemical inventory annually. Oh, I'm sorry. So the 59% have are clueless about their chemical inventory, what they have, how dangerous. And remember, some of these chemicals over time, they don't get along with their neighbor chemicals. And also, um, they also can degrade into something that can be explosive. And there have been accidents happen. Um, 
just just unbelievable. 37% of the schools are unsure how they dispose of their chemicals in the district. Ah, oh, you just throw them out in the soccer field. No, you just throw them down the drain. I've heard it all. I've heard it all. I mean, again, this is what's going on. 58% of the teachers could not recall the last annual safety inspection in their school. Eh, I'm sure everything is fine. There's no problem. 69% of the teachers are not used a safety contract or knowledge form for their students. Well, that's just great. Yep, yep. It's a good thing uh, that you'd have if you're sued that you can prove, in fact, that you reviewed the safety stuff with the kids. No, we don't, no, we don't do that, no. <clears throat> Other key findings, overcrowding, STEM accidents increase once class size exceeds 24. There's something magical about that 24 number, but it shows up in the research. Most of your labs, you will see, and this is approved by usually the state fire protection people, uh, fire marshal, most states have state fire marshals, and they review these plans uh, when you're going to do renovations or build laboratories, right? And most of them, not all, but many, most of them are for 24 students. 57% of the schools have classes larger than 25. 57, almost 60% are more, 25 or more, but only 26 of those schools have a facility large enough to support that many students. In other words, what we're saying is way over the legal occupancy load. Ah, legal occupancy load. That's not a recommendation as I've been told by principal. Oh, that's only a recommendation. We don't have to follow that. No. That is legal. That's an NFPA, National Fire Protection Association. Trust me on this. All right. Teachers reported overcrowding was the second largest perceived cause of accidents. Too many occupants. Now, remember, this is not class size. This is total occupants. So if I have not only students, I have the teacher. Um, I might have special ed paras, et cetera, et cetera. So you've got to look the whole group in there all occupants, not just students. <clears throat> More key findings. 62% of the teachers regard students not following instruction as a leading cause. Oh, I see. Put on your glasses. Put on your goggles. You know, it's very interesting. I have a personal experience with that. When I started teaching, it's like chemistry and physics way back when. In my first year, every period, I must have told 20 times students Put on your goggles, put on your goggles. Now their idea of putting on your goggles, something like this, they put it on their forehead, they have it hanging around their neck. That's their idea of putting on eye protect. No, it's over your eyes, all right? Over your eyes. But I learned real quick, right? And basically I said, look, when mine are on, yours are on. When mine are off, you can take yours off. I'm only, give, I'm only gonna tell you once. Then the next time it happens, you're gone, you're out, and it's a zero for that day for the lab. It's amazing how quickly they learn to appropriately wear the eye protection, all right? So again, 62%, unbelievable. 45% of the schools have ANSI Z87.1 D3, 2020 directly vented splash, indirectly vented uh, splash goggles for working with liquids, hazardous liquids, not good. Where do they do? They go to the dollar store and buy them. Oh yeah, you know why there's a reason they're only a dollar, of course now it's a dollar 25 due to inflation. That's because if you get hit, they shatter. They don't meet the ANSI standard, the ANSI ICA standard, all right? 45, 55% don't have the right kind of eye protection. One thing you need to do, check, and it says right on the side of those, if it meets the ANSI standard. 83% have safety glasses for students working with solids, right? Yeah, solids, fine. You can use safety glasses as long as there's with side shields, side shields, but not allowed for liquids, okay? Okay, I know that there are potential hazards and resulting risks in my school across the school district in the STEM and CD program. Now what? Help me understand where to look for these risks. Okay. Take a look at this image. Now, let me just point out a few things. There's good news. The good news is, oh, look, look at their eyes. They have indirectly vented chemical splash goggles. 
10 points, very good. However, however, you see the young lady there in a striped sweater? Notice that her shoulders are donned with her very long hair, which if she bends over and she's using a Bunsen burner, she's gonna become a lighthouse, all right? She's gonna go up in flames. Hair must be pulled back and tied, pulled back and tied. Also, they're dealing with hazardous chemicals. Where are the gloves for protection, the nitrile gloves or the vinyl gloves, depending what they're dealing with. And oh yeah, covering the body major. How about an apron? That would be a good idea. All right, these are all required PPE, better professional practices and in some cases, legal safety standards. <clears throat> oh, this is one of my favorite. All right, this is one of my favorite. All right. Look, oh, gee, they have lab coats. Well, that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. um, no gloves. And look what they have over their eyes. Safety glasses with side shields. Useless. Let me repeat that. Useless. Why is it useless? Because it's open here at the top. It's open underneath here. A splash, they're going to go blind. All right, or have severe eye injury. They need indirectly vented chemical splash goggles. This is a no-go. This is a no-go. And if you're a supervisor or administrator and you're walking by a lab and you see this, now all of a sudden you're also involved in that lawsuit. If you do nothing because you've seen it and you did nothing about it, remember that. So what grade that will do most accidents occur? It's mostly in elementary, middle, or high school level. Why do you believe this to be true? What makes one grade level more prone to accidents than others? Well, surprise, surprise, under the research, it turns out 70%, 70% accidents occur ninth grade. Boy, those teachers must get up to stipends to teach that. No, I don't guess not, maybe not, right? This is preventable statistic with safety training, modeling of expected techniques, accepted behaviors, and reviewing instructions prior to any lab. Notice, prior, not after the accident, prior, prior to any hands-on activity. This includes demonstrations, by the way. It's not just the hands-on piece. <clears throat> so what are the most common sources of accidents? All right, generally, glue guns, yeah, kids get burned, all right? Or they, they're doing this near a sink or water and they get, oh, gee, electrocuted. Well, that's always fun. Equipment, machinery, power tools. You better believe it. Using power tools without guards. I went into a tech ed lab one day doing a smock ocean inspection and I see a table saw. I notice there's no guard over the blade. I said to the teacher, um, teacher, where, where's the guard? Oh, that broke off uh, about a month ago. We have another one on order. I said, and you're allowing students to use that table saw? Well, yeah, but it's coming shortly. <laughs> no, so is the lawsuit when the kid gets loses a thumb. All right, spills and splashes, projectiles. Projectile. In other words, a bottle smashes, the glass flies all over the place. Springs. Well, that can be a projectile, right? <clears throat> okay. Moving right along. Most common types of injuries, cuts, lacerations, burns, trips, and falls, hits with projectiles, fumes, electric shock, right? 90% of injuries occur on the fingers and hands of a person which is reasonable to expect. Unfortunately, some of them occur on the face, all right? And some of them will be lifelong memories. How do schools reduce risk? The duty to maintain a safer science and engineering instructional space is shared by teachers, administrators, school boards, parents, and students. It's everybody's business. It's everybody's responsibility. Teachers and administrators need to communicate frequently in order to ensure that student safety remains a school priority. Embrace legal safety standards, better professional safety practices related to science and CTE programs, including specific safety training evaluation of activities using hazard analysis, risk assessment, 
resource documents, inspection as a starting point, again, before the activity or demonstration is done. Hazard analysis, I love this, this is great. AAA, I call this the driving home safety. AAA, driving home safety. Ministers have the duty of supervision for activities performed in STEM CD programs in their school. You have the duty of, legally, legally, you have the duty of supervision on these activities. So don't say you don't know what's going on, right? I'm not telling you to fabricate if you don't know, I'm saying get involved. The AAA method requires teachers to perform a hazard analysis before each lab demo as mandated by Standard 45 of the National Fire Protection Agency or Association, uh, <clears throat> then conduct a hazard assessment and take the best possible safety action. In order to perform this three-step approach to understand and evaluating hazards, you must follow these steps sequentially. Okay, the first A is for the analysis of the hazard. Again, remember, three hazards, physical hazard, all right? a spring, glass, right? Projectile, those are physical hazards. Chemical, hazardous chemicals, acids, bases, whatever, biological. If they're dealing with bacteria, um, if they're dealing with any kind of plant, whatever. Um, hazards outlined on the SDS, ah, safety data sheet. And in tandem with teacher experience or colleagues, safety notes from lab activity, use of the chemical hygiene plan, absolutely, if it's a chemical issue, and trusted safety authorities like Science Safety Incorporated. Risk assessment, all right? The second A, assessment. Use sections in the safety data sheet. I yeah, put them in there that highlight information for safer handling, such as hazards, fire safety, accidental spill information, stability, toxicological, um, it also talks about personal protective equipment that you're required to wear with this, et cetera, et cetera. The last A is the action you're gonna take, the safety action, determine the appropriate action based on the types of hazards and risks. The top three actions to consider based on OSHA prevention and control, including engineering control. Engineering controls, what, what is this all about? Engineering controls, that's the technology that's used to help make it safer in the laboratory. Ventilation, eye wash station, shower, electrical controls, gas controls, water controls, et cetera, et cetera. Those, uh, again, are engineering controls. Administrative controls, in other words, better professional practices, uh, regulations, et cetera, et cetera. And personal protective equipment, glasses, safety glasses, indirectly then chemical splash goggles, gloves, apron, even shoes, that type of thing certainly are involved here. Essential science laboratory safety resources. Some of these documents are often overlooked, but are mandated to be reviewed and managed annually, all right? Really good resources that you need to take a look at as an administrator, make sure these things are being done right. And of course, to make sure the teacher is following these, right? You hopefully have a science safety manual. Do you have one? Uh, are you using it? And sometimes this involves Board of Education policy. Ah, Board of Education policy. So you not only have legal safety standards, better professional practices, you're also dealing with the policies from your Board of Education. Do teachers know about it? Do they access this document? When was it last reviewed? Chemical hygiene plan. It's amazing, chemical hygiene plan, 1990. This became legal by OSHA. You had to have under the laboratory standard chemical hygiene plan. I couldn't tell you how many schools I visit and I want to see, just like the, the OSHA officer that comes in to take a look, chemical hygiene plan. So when's the last time this was updated? I look at the date, 1991. They did it the first year. That was it. They never looked at it again. They threw it away in the drawer. Come on, All right? Is it current? Is it reviewed annually? Are the standard operating procedures listed or adjustments made for COVID protocols? There's examples here. <clears throat> Safety acknowledgement forms, right? Again, um, this is similar to like a contract, but this is more of a legal deal, believe it or not. Um, this is important. Do they have, <coughs> excuse me, 
Where are these safely and securely stored? Remember, you have kids sign these and you also have the parents sign them. This helps the teacher in administration should there be a lawsuit, because this proves that students and parents were aware of the required safety protocols for laboratories, all right? Very important document. Um, how is this process managed internally in school district level? Annual physical safety inspection is requirement to have at a minimum at least one physical inspection of the science department. And usually the chose of this, the chemical hygiene officer who hopefully has the background. You can't expect the student, the superintendent of schools, um, even though they might be the Joe by default, to have an understanding of all these components. Uh, to use a district form and submit it to OSHA, sometimes they do, sometimes you don't have to normally. Uh, who performs these walkthrough inspections and document observation? So you can see this is planning ahead, all right, to help make it safer. Safety requires a holistic approach. Remember we said spectrally, the whole deal here, not just one little segment. There are multiple aspects of truly balanced and manageable hazard risk management program at the school district and at the school site that are based on a handful of key areas for administrators, teachers, and supervisor officers to be aware of. Having a holistic approach from multiple perspectives on an ongoing not 20 years ago, ongoing progressive basis is critically important to the delivery and culture of safety awareness across the district and individual school departments involved, all right? Again, you know, we're not just talking science here, we're talking tech and engineering, we're talking art, all right? Any place where you have found to be potential hazards, risks, et cetera. Safety requires a holistic approach. Why do schools need to take a holistic approach to safety? Proper facility design. Well, you know, yeah, let's talk about that just for a quick, quick moment here. Facility design. Who took part in the planning? Was it just the architect? Or did it involve administration, supervision, supervisors, and teachers, parents, the fire marshal, the building potential guy? from the town, on and on it goes. You really need a full committee here looking. And don't assume that the architect knows 100% what they're doing. I could tell you some horror stories. I won't, but I could tell you some, right? Um, and strict adherence to these with a balanced and manageable holistic approach to help to set off, will help to set off potential hazards and resulting risks posed by programs such as science, STEM, CTE. Holistic school district STEAM safety program. I love this diagram, it's cool, all right? Repeat every year, all right? Administrator, educator, student PD annually. Professional development for even administrators, not only students and the teacher, yeah. If you have the responsibility, you need to know what you're looking for. Chemical hygiene plan, yeah. Safety manual, annual review. Lab safety acknowledgement forms for the students and the parents to sign. Hazard analysis, risk assessment by the teacher or the educator for each activity, including a demo. Appropriate PPE for every person. Again, you follow, follow it, just follow the arrows, all right? You need eye protection, you need gloves, apron, etc. Shared current chemical inventory, updated SDS listings annual safety physical inspection of the science department, chemical storage appropriately, and also chemical disposal appropriate. Repeat, 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 right? And this is not only for STEAM, this is for science, tech ed, individually, lab, those laboratories. Document reviews and safety for management, having a current and recently reviewed and updated chemical hygiene plan, Safety manual for science and CT are important for minimizing legal liability, making it safety. Having the safety acknowledgement forms complete and archived. Now here's the rub with these uh, safety acknowledgement forms. In some states, um, teachers, administrators can be sued up to three years. In other states, when the student turns 18 or 21, they can be, you can be sued till then, 
All right, so you better find out for your particular state which it is, and that's how long you hold on to those acknowledgement forms because that's going to be one of your tickets in your defense, showing that you were actively trying to help make it safer by having kids trained and signed off on these things and in writing, All right? And you can you can save those on a computer. Uh, it doesn't have to be paper, all right? Because uh, so you can just print it out. Use of a safety acknowledgement form in CNCTE, communication of safety expectations should be a three-way dialogue among the school, the student, and the family. I mean, we've already mentioned this. Uh, students and parents should review and discuss safety acknowledgement. Now, let me just tell you one thing that does happen now and then. Teacher sends it home to be signed. The parent says, I'm not signing this. I'm not signing this. They're trying to put me in legal jeopardy. And basically the courts have said, okay, teacher, all you need to do is to communicate with that parent that this is critical, it's important for the student safety, and you, want, you agree, you know, they decide they do not want to sign it. However, you are signing it, you're dating it and noting that, that you had the discussion with the parent. You're done. The courts say, that's fine, you can do that. If the parent refuses to sign it, that's rare, but it does happen. The teacher must demonstrate the techniques and behaviors expected prior to the activity being performed with students and clarify if there's any misunderstanding among the class. Physical, and I love that photo, this great photo of the eye. Physical inspections, regulatory compliance requirements involve inspecting and reporting on the physical conditions of equipment, materials, safety infrastructure and controls used in the laboratory CTE facilities on a regular basis, All right? I saw a class once where the kid comes up to the teacher, this is in a science lab, and the uh, spectacle, or I should say the goggles that the kid was wearing, uh, it had the openings, the caps on the top, well, the caps were missing, which means there's big holes. The kid wants to know if he can get another pair. The teacher said, oh, Johnny, don't worry about it. Um, I'll give you a new one at the end of the period. Okay, help me understand this. I'll give you a new one at the end of the period. God forbid the kid gets splashed, goes through the hole, kid's blinded. Teacher's not gonna have a leg to stand on. Not a leg, to, you just don't do that. You stop right then and there, you take that one, you give the kid one, one all right? And that's part of making sure the equipment is operational. <clears throat> CTE rooms and associated tools and machine are inspected daily, absolutely. Laboratory facilities are inspected, documented. You know, but by the way, don't assume when a teacher leaves that laboratory or shop, whatever you want to call it, comes back the next day that someone did not go in there late in the evening and use the tools and, oh, gee, they broke the guard or so whatever, or uh, broke whatever, fume hood, who knows? That's why it's important before anybody's using things to make sure they're inspected appropriately. Laboratory facilities inspected and documented annually. Ventilations, ventilation, critical, critical in laboratories need to be inspected. Gas lines, water services need to be inspected. Fire safety, eye safety systems have inspection requirements also. Safety requires a holistic approach. Science safety embraces a holistic approach to your school safety program, starting with gap analyses, individualized training that's made for each grade level and subject area, digital student safety acknowledgement form management system. That's a big plus, right? Virtual safety assistant and annual safety inspections, chemical inventory management system that can handle the label and SDS needs in your department, annual reviews and trainings. All these things science safety and garbage can handle, all right? Science safety helps reduce your risk. Review of existing safety program documentation. We welcome the opportunity to explore your existing safety documentation, review your safety program. You need to know what you got and you need to know what you need. Customized learning for your educators, accessible 24 seven. Welcome the opportunity to create personalized learning modules. Teacher might not have a prep period that they can do during the day. Well, maybe in the evening or on a day off, they wanna do it. 24 seven, documentation of safety training research suggests that comprehensive safety training can be reduced accidents by 51%, more than half. 
Learning pathway is going to say that every teacher and student is a unique individual, so we provide personalized learning at age, grade, subject matter, appropriate use of blend of traditional, virtual, video, animation, scenario-based learning to achieve safety awareness outcomes. Over 350, yes, you're reading that right, 350 individual modules and over 400 discrete lessons that support safety and hazard awareness training with micro-credentialing, badging, and recital certificate authorization upon completion of the module or pathway in science, STEAM, and CTE. Content is aligned to with, I'm sorry, to ver legal professional standard-based safer practices, safer practices in each local jurisdiction. Free CHO training, contact science safety to gain access to an online science safety certificate program for CHOs valued at $500 for F-R-E-E, -E. you got it, free. Please share this free course with your chemical hygiene officer. Contact information is up here, toll free, no excuse, all right? Or you can use information here, infosciencesafety.com, all right? No excuse, check it out. And these are a list of the references, uh, beneficial resources that you can use that are really helpful. And some of, the, some of these are state specific like New York, but you can learn from them, all right? But you also need to make sure you get them from your own state. Uh, if you're under a state OSHA, a federal OSHA, Department of Labor, whatever, especially your chemical hygiene officer needs to know that information. Council of State Science Supervisors, National Science Teaching Association, International Technology Education and Educators Association. So very helpful. And there you have it. Ryan? Thank you, Ken. Um, we, during your presentation, we had a couple of people um, chime into um, the Q&A and I encourage others to uh, post their questions now. Um, we had a, someone asking for uh, more information um, related about the National Fire Protection Class Occupancy standards. Um, so we shared a couple links there. Um, yeah, that's, and, NFP, that's NFPA 101, Life Safety yep. Code. Yep. yep. Um, other words, uh, someone um, said that uh, they didn't know about the student safety acknowledgement forms um, before you, uh, they, you uh, presented on them tonight. Um, so they wanted to thank you for that. Um, that's good. That's good. Yeah. It was well worth them being here because that can save them legal headaches. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we have more questions coming in. Um, so does a recommended, uh, not recommended list of chemicals for middle school and high school labs exist? Uh, in my, in this person's research, they found that many contradictory lists are out there. Yeah, there are contradictory lists. Um, it, <laughs> unfortunately, there is no technical nationalist. Now, having said that, um, there are certainly chemical association uh, certainly has what they consider important. And there are the NSTA, there are a number of them. If you look at the uh, professional organization websites, I'm sure you will be uh, able to find them. And we can um, share some of those links after the, yeah. after the webinar. Um, another uh, person asked our School district told us that we should have safety training every three years. Is this an acceptable timeline? Absolutely not. Uh, OSHA specifically states that when anytime there is a change in the chemical hygiene plan, for example, which is required annually to do, and usually there are changes, a change in assignment. If I'm teaching biology course one year and the next year I'm assigned chemistry, yeah, I need to be retrained, no two ways about it. Um, there are any changes in the types of chemicals that are being used. If we take on some new kinds of activities, um, again, it needs to be safety training. So it's pretty safe to say, or safer to say, I should say, um, that an annual training really is required. Now, having taught 
grade nine, I, I have some some um, thoughts about this, but why, Ken, why do you think most accidents happen in grade nine? Uh, part of it is maturation level. <laughs> That's a start right there. Um, sometimes they're crawling out of their skin legal, technically, and they sometimes do not pay attention. Once in a while, I did have a grade nine class. Uh, they tend to be more hyperactive. They tend to be more involved with all kinds of things outside of school. Uh, they tend to be taking more time looking at their phones, not listening to you. Um, there's a whole bunch of reasons. Um, and part of it is the curriculum issues also. Sometimes uh, teachers uh, are giving them overly hazardous chemical use. Let's put it that way. Um, or even dealing with bio, I'm sorry, you know what, grade nine, you should not be going around the school with petri plates that have auger on it to collect specimens in the laboratories and also in the cafeteria and then bring them back and you're going to culture them and then you come under the microscope this is no lie i have seen this going on are you kidding me do you realize what these kids could be growing uh, no no absolutely no middle school forget it and especially in grade nine where they do offer sometimes biology in ninth grade, please do not culture bacteria or any other biological stuff. You're looking for dangerous kinds of results. So again, you can see there's a lot of things going on here. All right, teachers have that expectation that kids can handle it. No, they can't. Um, so from another person, um, um, can you talk, talk more about uh, hazard analyses and, and um, if new teachers are prepared to do them when they first step into the classroom? I'm not sure I quite understand the question. Um, are they saying do, that the teachers don't yeah, do, do they it? I guess, are, are they prepared to do it? Were they taught? Oh, oh well, that, a, but that in, comes with, with training. This is why you get them training at the beginning of the year when they're first employed, all right? So they know enough and they're told and you follow up supervision wise. You wanna see their plans, all right? You wanna see their lesson plans and you wanna look in their lesson plans to make sure that they've got the triple A activity in there before they're doing it. And they need to put it, to write it down in there so you can check to make sure. You're not only covering yourself, but you're making it safer for them and their students. Um, so uh, this person said that um, their principal told them that they can't afford new goggles uh, if a student or a teacher is injured. Are they like are they liable for not supplying uh, them with proper PPE? <laughs> Here's the teacher's response: You don't provide me with the legally required PPE. We are no longer doing hands-on work in the laboratories because if you do it you are the one that's going to get sued as well as the administrator but you will because you knew better you are now determined to be reckless you knew it was required and yet you went ahead and did because the principal told you that it was okay and they didn't have enough money no you don't have enough money you don't do it period that's a bottom line flashing red light on that one um so this person, um, uh, one of the schools has become as some dangerous chemicals uh, and has had them for years. How can they get them removed? Uh, you call a commercial outfit and they are out there. Um, you want a reputable one, but commercial outfit um, and you uh, have them come in, they check it out and they wrap it up and they take it out of there and it ain't gonna be cheap. <laughs> but you need to do, and this should be done annual annual chemical clean out now if it's been years since it's been done the first year you better fasten your seatbelt and that of your superintendent what it's going to cost you're talking tens of thousands of dollars to have that happen but once you get through that first one it's relatively smooth sailing of just a few thousand relatively speaking which is not much but uh, yeah no you, you've got to do that it's an annual event all right um, 
got to do it because again, there are very dangerous things that can happen to chemicals over time, all right? Um, you just, uh, the peroxides, for example, all right? Peroxides are explosive. You see things growing, uh, crystals growing on the caps. Don't touch it, call the bomb squad, all right? Because it is explosive. This is how about a decade or two, um, teacher in Maryland, biology teacher, all right? was going to use a stain and uh, which happened to be a peroxide based. Hazardous, yes, had the crystals all over it. Goes to open it, blew the elbow down off his arm, all right? Elbow down, gone, explosion, all right? So this is my point. You can't screw around with this stuff. You've got to do it annually, get rid of it. Thank you, Ken. Um, I know we've gone a little bit over tonight. Um, we appreciate your time and we appreciate everybody for uh, joining today. Um, please uh, reach out to us with any questions. This uh, link will be available if you want to, to go and, and, uh, and watch it through again or share it with colleagues. Um, Ken, thank you. Good night. Good night to everyone else. Take care. Bye-bye.